Thanks, Tim. Always appreciate your preludes. Welcome one and all to worship at Williamsburg Baptist Church. We're so delighted each and every one of you are here. And we're delighted whether you're joining us in person or watching us online. We're a congregation that has been in life and ministry for about 193 years now. And we're finding these days that even as we continue to navigate the challenges of the pandemic, we sense that God is at work among us. And there's a sense of energy and vitality and vibrancy to this place and this community. And we readily admit that we have a ways to go before we feel like we fully emerged from the throes of the pandemic. But your presence here is a gift and a sign of life and a sign that the Holy Spirit is moving in this place. And we really are grateful. Today is Pledge Sunday. It's the culmination of several weeks of, a, of our stewardship season in which we set aside time to pray and reflect on our personal finances and also on our church finances. And when we talk about pledges, all the pledges is simply a best guess about how much you think you and your family unit will contribute financially to the church in the year ahead, in 2022. Very practically, it's a way to help our church leaders prepare for the year ahead as they think about the budget and make plans. Theologically, though, I think that a lot more is at work when we think about stewardship and pledges. Part of the goal is to help us as people of faith shift our mindset from individual ownership that dominates Western civilization towards a mindset of stewardship where we recognize that everything belongs to God, even our very lives, even our very selves, and that through the grace of God, we're called to be stewards to the things that God has entrusted to us. Moreover, as we saw last week, we hope to move from a mindset of scarcity to abundance in which we recognize the ways in which God continues to provide for us daily. And so during the offering time, we'll ask that if you're ready to make a pledge for the year ahead, you can take a pledge card that our ushers are handing out, uh, fill it out and put it in the offering plate when it's passed around later in the service. If you aren't ready and need to have a conversation with a significant other or a conversation with your budget, that's okay too. You can pledge at any time online on our website under the Give tab. And Kim wanted me to tell you, you can change your pledge at any time. You can re-pledge online. There's so much grace and flexibility built into the system. It just helps us plan for the year ahead. I'll give you a quick example. If someone today pledges a million dollars, we're going to go ahead and hire some new staff and buy an espresso machine. <laughs> and contact our mission partners too, they'll be excited. The main thing though is to aim for honesty and your best guess of what you think you or your family unit will give. I wanna say this very briefly too, there's a lot of optimism among our church leadership about our finances. We feel as though we've weathered the brunt of COVID and we're ready to thrive as a congregation in the midst of our community. And so your pledge and your support in so many ways help us do that. And so we're so grateful for all the ways in which you support this community of faith. Just a, a small handful of announcements before we move deeper into worship. We'd love for you to wear name tags if you get a chance. I, I've started keeping mine in my office. I don't know what the system is back here, but there are name tags in the back and we'd love for you to wear them. Write your name on it and if you'd like to, write your pronouns on them. It's hard to recognize people behind masks and so we'd love for you to start wearing name tags in worship and helps us get to know one another better too. Trunk or Treat is coming up on Sunday, October 31st at 1 p.m. We had so much fun last year and we'd love for you to join us for it this year. You can sign up with Deb to decorate your trunk, hand out candy and volunteer. Yes, right here, thank you. Uh, we'll get pizza and feed you after worship if you stick around for that. The link to sign up is in the e-news or you can just reach out to Deb. Last but not least, oh, my pledge card, my attendance card that's been in here for months is gone. Will someone ha hold up an attendance card? They're in the pew backs. Thank you, Glenda. If you look in the pew back right in front of you, there's an attendance card that we'd love for you to fill out during worship. This is simply a record that you are with us today. If you'd like to sign up for our e-newsletter and our weekly prayer, uh, weekly prayer email, we'd love for you to put your information on that too. That's enough for me for now. We're delighted that you're here. Welcome one and all to worship. Mm -hmm. 
join me in a call to worship. Um, we're going to read responsively, so uh, you will read the bold print. We cherish the earth beneath our feet. From the dust of the earth, God created us. We cherish the air that we breathe. With a single breath, God brings us to life. We cherish the water that cleanses us. We cherish the sun that shines upon us. We love the God sent the Spirit upon the heavens to guide us. We cherish God's abundant love and grace. In gratitude, we respond to songs of praise.
may be seated. I just want to, I think it's important to give credit where credit is due. Lynn wrote that call to worship, and it was so good. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, choir, too. As we move into a time of prayer, I want to share with you that we had such a meaningful gathering yesterday as we celebrated the life of Jim Whitney in this space. The sanctuary was near full as folks gathered from all over to mourn the loss of Jim Whitney, but also to celebrate a life well lived. And we really do give thanks to God for the opportunity to know him and for the opportunity to journey with him in this community of faith for so many years. We're also praying for Karen Sublett as she faces cataract surgery. And there are a number of uh, prayer concerns listed in our weekly prayer newsletter. If you don't get that, we'd love for you to reach out to us in the church office, and we'd be glad to add you to that list. As I begin our prayer, I'll leave a time of silence at the beginning for you to offer up your own prayers in silence to God. And then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer and a Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Lord, in the stillness, you whisper words of stirring. In our turmoil, you whisper words of calm. In every time and place, your voice is present, whispering what we need to hear. And so, God, we pray in this place that we might hear your word for us. And God, we confess that all too often we struggle to listen to you, to hear your voice. We're distracted by so many things. And so we pray that you will draw us back to you so that our worship might help us refocus our eyes on your glory and our ears on your word. Keep on speaking, Lord, until we hear and until we obey. God, today we also pray for those who have no space. No space to hear your voice, let alone heed it. We pray for those surrounded by noise, the noise of fighting, of hurt, of betrayal, the noise that drowns out the still, small voice of God in the turmoil. We pray for those who are so hungry that they can think of nothing else but their quest for food, for those who are so weary that they can think of nothing else but where they will find rest. For those who feel so unloved and rejected that they can think of nothing else but the release of death. God, help us to reach beyond the fullness and the noise, the hunger and the weariness, the hurt and the loss. To touch and to heal every brokenness in this room and in the, this community and in the world. Making room for you and your love the love that lightens the darkness and transforms all of life. God, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hi everyone, my name is Elliot. I use they, he pronouns. Uh, today I'll be doing the scripture reading from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under Eli. The Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. One day Eli, whose eyes had grown so weak he was unable to see, was lying down in his room. God's lamp hadn't gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the Lord's temple, where God's chest was. The Lord called to Samuel, I'm here, he said. Samuel hurried to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go lie down. So he did. Again the Lord called to Samuel. So Samuel got up, went to Eli, and said, I'm here, you called me? I didn't call my son, Eli replied. Go and lie down. Now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord, and the Lord's word hadn't yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli, and said, I'm here, you called me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord that, who was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down where he'd been. Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of all who hear it tingle. On that day, I will bring to pass against Eli everything I said about his household, every last bit of it. I told him that I would punish his family forever because of the wrongdoing he knew about, how his sons were cursing God, but he wouldn't stop them. Because of that, I swore about Eli's household that his family's wrongdoing will never be reconciled by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay there until morning, then opened the doors of the Lord's house. 
Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel, saying, Samuel, my son, I'm here, Samuel said. What did he say to you? Eli asked. Don't hide anything from me. May God deal harshly with you, and worse still, if you hide from me a single word from everything he said to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. He is the Lord, Eli said. He will do as he pleases. So Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not allowing any of his words to fail. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was trustworthy as the Lord's prophet. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh through the Lord's own word. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Elliot, for reading scripture. Buckle up, folks. We're going to take a big jump in the narrative lectionary from last week to this week. Last week, we're in Exodus, and the Israelites were headed out of Egypt and into the wilderness. They had no idea as they stepped foot into the wilderness that they were just beginning what would become a 40-year journey on their way to the promised land. As a sort of aside, I can't help but think about March 2020 when schools were first shut down for the pandemic. And they they called us and said, schools are going to be closed for two weeks. Hang in there. Sometimes I I think if we knew up front what we were getting ourselves into, we'd never be able to make it for the journey ahead. I think about the Israelites when I think about that moment. While the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, they stop and camp at Mount Sinai, where God will give them first the Ten Commandments and then a whole host of other laws that would become known as the Torah. And this forms the basis of so much of the first five books of the Bible. Uh, if you start in Genesis and start reading straight ahead, you, folks often stumble about halfway through Exodus because it's there where we start just getting laws upon laws, and especially in the Leviticus. And that's another story for another day or another sermon for another day or something. We'll, we'll tackle Leviticus one of these days. But what the laws are, offer are God's instructions for this newly liberated people on how to live as a community of faith together in their particular context. And by the time the Israelites arrive at the Promised Land, there's a new leader at the helm, Joshua. You may recall that Joshua was the one who leads God's people as they conquer the Promised Land. We talked a little bit about this last summer and some of the challenges that that text poses to us as they, they violently conquer the indigenous people who lived there. Once they're settled, however, they're led by judges in their various tribal factions. And as we arrive at today's story in 1 Samuel, we meet a boy named Samuel who will become the prophet who will anoint Israel's first king, Saul, and later King David. Go ahead and pat yourself on the back. We just covered like five or six books of scripture. Job job well done. Samuel is something of a miracle child. His father, Elkanah, has two wives. Penina has several children, but Hannah has none. And Hannah makes a vow that if she ever has a child, she'll dedicate the child to God and to God's service. And so sure enough, she soon becomes pregnant. She has a boy child whom she names Samuel, which interestingly enough means God hears him. And once the child is weaned, Hannah brings him to the sanctuary at Shiloh, where he comes into the service of an elderly priest named Eli, who serves God at the sanctuary. When we meet Samuel in chapter 3, he's still a boy serving at the sanctuary, and maybe a best guess is he's something like middle school aged, if you're curious. It's interesting as we wade into chapter 3 that verse 1 says, The word of the Lord was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. 
I think so often when we read scripture, we have a tendency to think that the experience of people in the text are radically different than our own experiences. That when biblical characters encounter God, God seems much more immediate and God's presence seems much more obvious and God's words are so much clearer to them. Whereas we often struggle to make sense of God's presence in our lives or understand how God is speaking to us because most of us aren't used to hearing God speak audibly. If you do, fantastic, but my guess is that most of us don't. And so I can't help but feel that this text might be relatable in, in more ways to many of us because the characters' experiences of God in this time are similar to our own. It's the middle of the night. The priest Eli, whom Samuel serves, has grown old, and his eyes are dim so he can no longer see very well. And Eli and Samuel are both asleep. And suddenly God speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel, Samuel. And the boy pops up in bed and responds, here I am. He runs to Eli, who I'm assuming is still asleep. And he says, in effect, I heard you calling me. What's up? What do you need? Eli shakes his head groggily and says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Once again, and I think comically, God calls to Samuel in the night again. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel pops up again and runs to Eli and says, here I am. Once again, Eli sends Samuel to bed. This happens a third time, and at this point in the story, I, as a parent of young kids, start to empathize deeply with Eli, who probably just wants to salvage what's left of a good night's sleep. But in spite of his grogginess, Eli starts to wisen up. He realizes that it's God's voice calling to Samuel, and so he says to the boy, Go and lie down. If you hear the voice again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so Samuel goes back to bed as he's told. And verse 10, Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, your servant is listening. The story goes on, and truth be told, it's more than we can unpack in one sermon. Eventually, there's a changing of the guard, and as Samuel grows older, he becomes the prophet that Israel looks to for wisdom and guidance for their future. And as I said before, he'll eventually help inaugurate a new era with the anointing of Israel's first kings. But this story in itself is fascinating. He's called by God. And yet he doesn't know that it's God who is the one who's calling him. And I really do think that it's humorous in the text as he goes back and forth from bed to Eli. Neither of them has any idea what's going on initially. And it's only through Samuel's dialogue with Eli that they're finally able to figure out that it is indeed God speaking and how Samuel should respond. And I can't help but think that so often in our own lives, we struggle to understand if or how God is speaking to us, or if the message we feel like we're receiving is actually from God or not. It's not always possible for us to hear God's voice on our own in isolation from one another, or even if we hear God's voice, whether it's through reading scripture or through a feeling, like a gut-level feeling that we have, it's not always possible for us to understand it or interpret it well. But this story reminds us that so often in life, it's through the voices of others who help us and help us orient ourselves to the voice of God in our lives. It reminds us of the importance of community in our lives and in our practice of faith and in affirming our sense of call in this world. We can't be people of faith in isolation from one another. So often in life, it's only through our conversations with others that we begin to understand how God is speaking to us. Today's text also reminds me of the importance of listening to diverse voices as we seek to hear God's voice clearly in our lives. For all intents and purposes, Samuel is just a kid. 
He's never heard God's voice before. And he needs the wisdom of, it, of Eli, his old blind mentor, to figure out how God is calling to him. But for what it's worth, Eli also needs Samuel and all of his youthfulness and naivete to speak hard words of truth that Eli needs to hear. Diversity matters when it comes to hearing God's voice. Young and old, able-bodied and differently abled, black and white, straight and queer, trans and cisgendered, maybe even conservative and liberal, and rich and poor, and folks from different nationalities. We can't hope to fully understand God in a vacuum in a, or in a homogenous group of people. Diverse points of view offer us new ways of understanding and encounter God, encountering God. They disrupt our own preconceived notions. They help prevent us from imagining that God is simply telling us what we ourselves want to hear. A couple examples come to mind. One, ordination. At best, or ordination process is an invitation to a dialogue between someone who feels called and to those who are in the best position to help this person discern how God is calling them. This is what I think God is calling me to do. I think God is calling me to ministry or to serve the church in such and such way. Is this what you see in my life? Is this how you see God calling me? Is this the direction you think God is leading me in? These sorts of questions provide an opportunity for someone to say, you know, from my point of view, this is exactly how God is calling you. Or perhaps alternatively, it provides someone with the opportunity to say, you know, I don't really think God is calling you to be a pastor or to be such and such. You have a tendency to stay up until 4 a.m. on Saturday nights binge watching Squid Game or whatever is new on Netflix, and you never seem to make Sunday mornings a priority in your own journey of faith. Who knows? It may be that this sense of call is rooted in your own ego instead. However God is calling us, we need to listen to the voices of others. Other voices provide us with wisdom, and help us align our lives in the right direction. This goes for all of us, whether it's about ordination or vocational ministry or something altogether different. Two, it's important for us when we read scripture to read in community. Personal study of scripture is of course important, but even from the very beginning, reading scripture almost always took place in community. It was read aloud in worship, and no one had personal Bibles in the first or second or third centuries. They hadn't invented the printing press yet, and for that matter, most folks didn't know how to read. And so they only ever heard scripture in community. And scripture has always been something that we wrestle with together. In fact, it's dangerous when we don't have conversation partners when it comes to reading scripture, folks who help us balance out our own biases. Look what happened in Nazi Germany or in our own American history when white slave owners supported slavery with scripture. Or even now when people read scripture and suggest that it demands the silence of women in worship or the exclusion of certain people from worship or the community of faith. We have to have other voices to help point out our blind spots for us. One of my own personal practices in this regard is when I'm preparing to teach or preach, I seek out diverse scholars in my preparation. I don't just read white male scholars. Instead, I try to find readings from feminist scholars or black scholars or queer scholars or scholars from other countries or socioeconomic locations. And this chorus of voices helps me to balance out my own personal biases and perspectives and helps me to read scripture from new angles. Finally, listening to diverse voices helps us to see our own traditions in a new light. Sometimes when we do things day in, day out, or week in, week out for years or decades on end, it gets stale and we lose the meaning of it. I'll never forget, years ago I had the opportunity to travel to Ghana with a group from my seminary. 
And while we were there, we visited churches for worship. And the offering time in Ghanaian churches is so different than we're used to here in our American, at, at least white American churches. During the offering time, musicians would play music, and everyone in the congregation would dance forward down the aisles and place their offerings either in a box or on the communion table at the front. And I couldn't help but think, what an amazing way to view this moment of offering and worship, where we have the privilege of giving back our gifts to God, where we recognize that everything that we have comes from God, and so God invites us into this moment of generosity and worship where we offer our very best back to God, trusting that when we do, God will continue to sustain us. Whereas I once felt like the offering in worship was just a boring moment uh, or a chance to talk to whoever I'm sitting with, I now view it through a lens of gratitude and as a moment where we have the privilege of returning our gifts to God with joy and in celebration. And so I'm excited to announce today during the pledge, moment of pledge, we're all going to dance forward and offer, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't run that by the stewardship committee, but we'll talk next year, okay? It's important to listen to diverse voices and have diverse experiences because they orient us to new ways of thinking and being and learning what it means to be people of faith. Folks, my encouragement to you this morning is to keep your ears open, to keep our ears open as we move forward as a community of faith. Let's keep listening to the voice of God as God calls all of us. And as we do, let's continue to listen and keep dialoguing with one another and with diverse perspectives, because it's so important to understand, to our understanding of who God is calling us to be as a church and in the world. It takes a community to hear God speaking to us, and we need each other, and that, folks, is a gift, because there are some pretty amazing people in this room, and I'm biased, of course, but I know there are some pretty amazing people outside of this room as well. Let's keep listening. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'll tell you a, a funny story. <clears throat> so, one Sunday after church, uh, really early on, my attendance at WBC, my mom and I were in the car on the way home, and I mentioned to her how cool it was that I had seen regular church members read the scripture passages each week. Not just the pastor, not just the elders or the church leadership, but everyone. And no more than two days later, an email shows up in my inbox from Art 
asking me if I wanted to read a scripture passage in worship. So I immediately texted my mom, I screenshotted the email, and I said, how does he know? Did you tell him, or does he have some kind of extrasensory perception? She claimed she didn't tell her anything multiple times, and somehow I kind of believed her. Okay then, magic it is. Wow. Several weeks later, she did admit that Art had emailed her first, and that she turned him down and sent him to me. So, not quite the ESP I had imagined. Just in case you were wondering, I can now definitively prove to you that your pastor does not, in fact, have any magic powers. <laughs> but I think there is something of an ordinary magic to this place. There's an ordinary magic in God's extraordinary love made manifest through the body of Christ and community here. From the moment I walked in here for the first time, I felt it. I didn't become a member of this church until recently, probably because I didn't feel for a second from any of you that I had to become a member in order to be seen, loved, affirmed, and meaningfully drawn into the life of this church. And I did become a member before I preached, because I'm like, if I'm going to take the pulpit, I better be a member. That's a unique experience for me in my adult life, not having to become a member to be known. And it means everything to me as far as churches go. This place is special, and I want it to be around as long as humanly possible for myself, for our community, and for the world. So, long story short, or long story long, sorry. I encourage you to support this church, either financially or through other God-given gifts and talents. Um, so, we have pledge cards, and I would encourage you to fill them out, either today or sometime in the future. I give thanks for this church every day. All right, friends, let us pray, and I will disclose that while I usually write my liturgy, this prayer I did not write. <laughs> I stole it off the internet. <laughs> God, giver of life and source of freedom, we know that all we have received is from your hand. You call us to be your stewards, of abundance, the caretakers of all you have entrusted to us. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen.
closing hymn. It may come as a surprise to you to hear that God is calling you. It may be in a still, quiet voice at night while you just wish you could go to sleep. That was my experience last night. It may be that God comes in the sound of a whirlwind in a cave on a mountain. But it may also be that God is calling you through ordinary magic through conversations with friends or in community. So my encouragement to you this morning as we move into a time of response is to reflect on how God is calling you. As we sing together step by step, I invite you to respond where you are or if you want to come forward and share with me, I welcome you to come forward as well. It's going to have to be quick, though, because it's a short song. <laughs> I will tell you, Tim is going to play through the end once on the organ, and then the choir will sing once, and then we'll all join our, our voices together for the third time through on this song that's new to us. So let's sing together as we respond, step by step. <laughs> Just a word of encouragement. Would love for you to linger after worship and connect with someone new or someone old, someone familiar. You can gather in the courtyard or out on the front steps or linger here. We have the doors open to let a breeze through. If you need to run, that's okay, run. But we're struggling, like so many folks are struggling to connect these days, and so would love for you to. Meet someone new, take someone out for coffee, go get lunch together, maybe even better yet, head over to the outlets where there are food trucks and local artisans and our very own um, artist in residence, Michael Jones, this afternoon. I'm sure he would love to see you, but just hear me offering a word to connect with someone. It's, an, it's important these days. As we, we prepare to depart, hear these words of benediction. Go in peace, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God you are born into this world. By the grace of God you have been kept all the day long, even until this hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the, in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Thanks be to God.
Amen. It's a good post in my